You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Networks Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for June 26, 2020. It's not safe for work. Coming to you live from the Cornfield Resistance, where the dust cloud of doom is brushing up against our state, but at least we're not Missouri. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. for the state of Missouri, or Fuck we Missouri. certainly love our Fuck listeners Missouri. in Missouri. In Missouri. Fuck, Missouri. Fuck Missouri. The whole state. <laughs> you know, I, I have relatives who are there. I have yes. um, my family's hometown. Uh, well, well, my mom's side is from Ava, Missouri, I believe, which is a little... My best friend enough. from and, high school lives in Missouri. Yeah. Yep. And the reason my relatives are there is they, they escaped the press gangs, apparently, during the Civil War <laughs> yeah. by yeah. crossing the river and running away from getting hauled into the Confederate Army. So... You know. But you have in our notes, uh, Missouri is changing its official nickname from the show me state to the I'm not going to look. You can't make me look. There is nothing to see here. La, 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 la. I'm not listening to you, state. Yeah, because it's now, like. What is the specific trigger for that? Uh, that the governor, Mike Parson, tweeted on June 23rd of 2020, not 2019, not 2017, literally this week. We are not overwhelmed. We are not currently experiencing a second wave. We have no intentions of closing Missouri back down at this point. Some helpful people put up the graphs of real-time COVID metrics, especially Mm -hmm. in the state of Missouri, and they just look like shit. And and it is a symptom of a larger problem, which is Republican governors are going to lie about outbreaks in their states until enough people die or Mm -hmm. get sick that they just can't lie anymore. And then they're going to have a sudden come to Jesus moment where they're not going to take any responsibility for the shit they did. They're not going to take any responsibility for supporting a, a psychotic president who likes to see people die in large numbers. He just doesn't want to count them because that looks bad for him. No. And well, I think it goes to a larger message than that too, which is racism. And, yeah. and this is a large part of what we want to talk about today. The Republican Party is the party of races and the yes. party of white nationalism. Yes. And the the statistics that are coming out are that approximately 30 percent of black people in this country know someone personally who has died of COVID-19. Nine percent of white people know someone personally who has died of COVID-19. That statistic is not lost on Republican governors who have no interest in saving black lives. There's no political reason for them to do it. And we're going to talk more about this. I mean, I think it touches on everything that we're talking about in politics today. The uh, local Black Lives Matter, uh, I, I can't say president, but members, as well as supporters and allied organizations. Um, first of all, they prefer to use the word accomplices. And mm. I think that's a very good word. I am an accomplice. Yeah. I'm a Black Lives Matter accomplice. You know, mm. I'm, I'm in on their conspiracy and happy to be so. <laughs> um, and secondly, the idea that, fuck you, I'm not here to hold your hand. <laughs> I'm done yeah. holding people's hands. I'm done trying to coax them into believing there's a problem. I'm done trying to go, here's some breadcrumbs and maybe 20 years from now, you'll you'll be less Archie Bunker than you are now. I'm tired. I'm t- th- this is the sentiment. I, I share it entirely. Um, which is, I am tired of holding people's hands. And and that sentiment really brought me back to Steve Gilliard uh, yeah. from 2004 yeah. and five, the late, great yeah. Steve Gilliard, who wrote, you know, I think it was his Fighting Liberal Post, which is one of his more famous ones. Um, I'm not interested in debating these people. I'm interested yeah. in destroying them. I'm interested in driving them back into the sewer. I want them to hate me. I want them to be so angry and so frightened of me. They run away from me. I, we, you mean they're, like they're leaving Twitter and going to Parlor? Yes. yes. <laughs> Apparently, Parlor is the what is the journalist for wingnuts? Yes. Is that right? It's right, the, right. The, it'll be the private Twitter where we can take our it's pants off and wave our dicks around. Right, exactly. And no one will will call our videos edited or our information disinformation. So, yeah. yeah. Recently, what with all the people dying and Donald Trump clearly going down the drain, um, they are. 
oscillating between this sort of strutting, arrogant, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a racist, but look, there's this example of voter fraud in New Jersey where two guys did a thing, so screw you. That kind of, you know, brain dead nonsense with mm -hmm. this sort of pleading with, look, I have a right to my opinion. And I expect everyone to respect my right. I respect your right. Why are you picking on me? And they're, oh my God, you're you're the worst combination of whiny bedwetting coward and strutting little Nazi imaginable. When five minutes ago you were liberal snowflakes right. want to destroy America anti-family. I have a right to my opinion. Well, and, and it's Susie punched me back. Yeah. That's what it is. It's how dare you punch me back. And by the way, that is an old thing in our in my family. You know, right? <laughs> Timmy, Timmy hit me back. Like wow, Timmy hit me. wow! Run, run into the room full of adults uh, yelling, "Timmy hit me back!" Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and that's all day every day on the social media with the wingnuts. Right, right. Do you want to talk about the little bit of drama we had in our family this oh, yeah. week? Yeah, we had <laughs> we had the tiniest amount of drama this week, as you as you all know. We have over 1,000 teenagers living at our home now. With um, with 5 billion uh, cat. used cars in yeah. our driveway. <laughs> and 5,000 cats. And, you know, it really is uh, the uh, old Mother Hubbard. No, we have yeah. three teenagers and one 20, well, two teenagers and one 21-year-old, one of whom is having a birthday next week. Next week, middle child is turning birthday. 18. 18th I can't birthday. take it. I can't take it. And 16-year-old, but... as you know, uh, turned 16 and got her driver's license just as the plague hit. So her she her got plan, her driver's license on February 28th yeah. and on March 15th, everything shut down. Yeah. It's so unfair. Yeah. Her plans for the summer were had had we were never going to see her this summer. Right. <laughs> was, yeah, that was her plan. You know, just right. send money, dirty clothes kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and and so she was um, not gallivanting. She was out and about you know, driving and going to work or going, going to work. Or yeah. Or whatever yeah. it was. And she very, very lightly tapped the bumper of the person in front of her at an intersection who stopped abruptly, which uh, happens. And, and the person stopped abruptly because someone ahead of them stopped abruptly. Right. I mean, it is. Chain reaction. Chain reaction. And as you told me, because you went and inspected uh -huh. the vehicle that we I insure. I did. And you said, oh, I see there's a little tiny bend in the front license plate. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. It the really was a you know, three mile an hour, boom. Oh, what happened? But the, the tin was... license plate absorbed the shock of the entire right. accident. <laughs> exactly. and apparently the car that she hit was a bigger shit box than the one she drives. Which wow. Is really... Yeah. <laughs> that, that's saying something. <laughs> and then the lady came storming out of the car going, my neck, my back, I'll never walk again. Yeah. So we got a call, a panic stricken call about everything's fine, but I, and, Anyway, it was exactly what. Well, it, and and she keeps a lot inside. Let's yeah. let me put it that way. Yeah. Usually, monosyllable. But yes. this was dramatic for her for because her. she's first sixteen accident. and it's her first accident, and she doesn't understand. You know, she yeah. called crying and saying, "You know, our insurance is going to go through the roof." And I said, "No, it's already through the roof, honey. You don't have to worry oh, about yeah. that. Worry about it. I'm covered. never going to be allowed to own a car," she said. Yes, yes. It's going on your permanent record, and I need I need you, Mister Drift Glass, uh, here right now. So, uh, but we we it was fine. It was fine. But yeah. what flashed through my head was mm -hmm. all of the things that we have to do different now that we have a plague. Yeah. You yeah. know, we have to make sure everyone is distancing at a, a minor traffic accident. Everyone even during a, a minor mask. traffic accident, yes, and, and yes. But all of the all of these safety and distancing and sort of keeping your cool um, instructions are sort of piled onto every because this is just a, a minor minor the most minor traffic accident you could imagine happening yeah. to a teenager at the time when a most new teenagers, driver yeah yep. at the time yep. when most of most teenagers get into some minor traffic accident they get a scrape on the door they clip a bumper right. or something like that they they aren't aware of the mm -hmm. the dimensions of the vehicle they're driving yeah. right right and, but then right. this is now you know jumped up a notch because of the times we live in right that right. is so fraught now it's so everything is potentially much much more dangerous just in physical contact with people. Um, and so it was one of those moments where, okay, all my normal, you know, dad reflexes kicked in like, Oh, wait a minute. That's right. There's a plague. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. What do right. we have to do now? We have to, if, it, if we leave the door, we have to have hand sanitizer. We have to have a mask and be careful driving and interactions with the police are going to be very tense right now. Even though we had the teller 96 times, all he's going to do is fill out a report. Right. Now, she was really upset that we recommended to her, as we have instructed all of the children, whenever your car touches another car, get a police report. A police report. That protects you. It's very important to do it. And uh, she, as I said, was crying on the phone, and I'm never going to be able to own a car because of this. And, you know, she does her, her... experience is she's lacking right. experience right. and she's lacking perspective and her the front lobe of her brain isn't fully connected yet right. so as, as was mine not mine yes. and yours and everyone else right i mean that's <laughs> the, the way it is so uh and i told her but having she said but i hate cops mom <laughs> yeah oh well you know and and right now she's all of her friends are black and black lives matter is the center of her life because mm-hmm. frankly that's what gets her out of the house right now and gets her with her friends is marches and rallies and, you know, being active uh, outside. So, well, I told her, and I'm not saying that's cause I'm not saying that's the cause. She really does believe in this, but uh, you know, she's also just very angry with the police in general and didn't want police involved in her life. And, uh, well, this is again no as little I, perspective. <laughs> as I told her, you will yeah. be able to own a car one day. You will not be able to date until you're probably twenty. <laughs> until you're thirty-seven. Yes. Like that, like that. But it was it was it. This is a really trivial, everyday, normal thing that mm-hmm. everyone goes through. But everything, as I'm sure all the listeners have stories just like this, which is right. This normal right. thing. I, I I think it's it's it was Toby in the West Wing. You know, it's when the normal things go wrong that people freak out. The normal 99 cent hamburger things, when those Mm -hmm. things are suddenly in peril or wrong or broken, that's when ordinary people go, wait, what the hell? What Mm -hmm. the hell? Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. I have to worry about this shit now? But this is this is the baseline of existence. What reality is breaking down, not just some thing out in the distance I can ignore. Yeah. And that's what's happening yeah. to everyone, as far as I can tell. It's people are getting the fact that the normal fabric of their daily lives is now being permanently disrupted. Yep. Um, and and, it's the, not and, and that we're already of, talking about a new normal is very historically significant. Yes. yes Historians will tell you that the French Revolution, people were talking about the Ancien Regime, the old times, the old uh-huh. regime. Yep. Within a month or two after the French Revolution, yeah. and it was a consciousness of a break in time mm-hmm. that was important, that changed things and made for a deeper change than there would have been. Everything that's happening now, and everyone talks about, oh, 2020 is just the worst. Now we have this dust cloud over us and, you know, oh, 2020, could you bring us anything more <laughs> bad stuff, you know? But this w- this year will be known in history forever the as herbalist. yeah, a time when America and the world had to have this colossal battle between the old way of doing things, the white supremacist way of doing things, the assumption of white uh, superiority in terms of the law, in terms of policing, in terms of value to our society. Mm-hmm. Disposability, uh, yeah. Disp- the disposability of black lives is over. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope uh, so. I, we I, hope so. I think so. Yeah. And th- right now, and this is the thing that sort of gets me on my blog with my stupid keyboard, you know, more often than not is... Until my, two in the morning. Until two in the morning. Yeah, well, <laughs> that was last night. So if you hear me yawn, yeah. it's it's honestly earned. <laughs> um, and it was a David Brooks column, so screw We're you We're going to get to that. Yeah. Five, but, he's going to have his five minutes hate. Just hold on. <laughs> just below the surface or just over the horizon or, or among councils of people who have more influence than you and I do. It's really clear right now that there's a fight going on, a pitched battle going on over who gets to write history. Yep. Who get who yep. gets to look into the past and pick the pieces out of the past that we will use to make the that the the story of the past will be these five things. Right. And right. we are pushing back as mightily as we can against people who are desperate to get on with lying about the Republican Party. 
Yeah. Desperate. Well, to and if you look at the if you look at the history of the Republican Party in our lifetimes, and and you and I were talking this week about how when do we start the story of Republicans getting away with cheating? Yeah. And you know, you we can go back to Goldwater and Nixon and on and on. Yeah. If you go, if you start, if you decide to start with Nixon, which most people are aware of Watergate. Mm-hmm. And so if you start with Nixon cheating in 1968 to get into office. Yes. And cheating in 1972 to get reelected. Yeah. 1972, Roger Stone. Right. Oh, and Paul Reagan, Manafort. And Paul Manafort. Roger Stone. And Paul Manafort. Uh-huh. Roger Stone. And Lee Atwater. Bush, Roger Stone. Uh-huh. Reagan, Roger Stone. Mm-hmm. And now Roger Stone might go to jail or might be the fixer, mm-hmm. Bill Barr, might make it so he doesn't go to jail. Right. Because we have, I love, Wonkat had a quote about Bill Barr is the, something to the effect of Bill Barr is the most activist, passionate defender of justice in the history of the planet for five people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I want to get back to our notes real quick. Yeah. Starting with, um, yes, polls are terrible for Trump right now. Vote anyway. Yeah. I went on vote.org this week. It takes 30 seconds to check your voter registration and make sure you're registered. Mm -hmm. And you may be able to get a form to order an absentee ballot there as well, depending on your state's rules. I do recommend it. Vote.org. Easy peasy. Go do it. Well, and I will say this. When I was knocking doors uh, for Betsy Dirksen Lomdegren last time, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, the number one thing, the number one ask was, do you want a mail-in ballot? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like this is a brand new thing. It, it is right. a, no, it, it's no. just yeah. better on every level if your state does it and if they do it honestly, because it lets your candidate bank the votes early. And they and, get counted first on election day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and yes, you are much more likely to vote if you have a ballot at your house. Yes. That's just the fact. Yes. So I do, even though you and I resisted that for a while, because we're like, no, it's a tradition. We like to go yes. to the voting booth yeah. and you like to get a lemon bar from I the do. lady at the church I who bakes lemon bars which they don't bake anymore it's all store bought, so it's screw well with the yeah. covid you know so yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the the most secure way to vote is by mail yeah uh and so yeah recommend that um there was a kaiser poll speaking of polls uh this week that showed that twice as many people who were asked about the greatest threat to the united states twice as many said trump over the coronavirus what about Donald Nancy Trump Pelosi, huh? Here. What, yeah. what about Nancy Pelosi, huh? What about She's a- Antifa? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell me about this. I didn't watch this John Bolton interview that Nicole Wallace did. Uh, I didn't either. I listened to it. I was, I was. Oh, you listened to it I on was, your headphones. Okay. I was zipping around the house doing really important tasks. I mean, just incredibly important things like weeding. Laundry or and food. Laundry. <laughs> I, I believe there was some clipping involved of some kind, but I was doing ah. stuff. I was doing house stuff. I listen. I'm like, oh, my God, Nicole Wallace is doing what no one should do, giving Mm -hmm. John Bolton a seat at the table and unrestricted access to a television camera to pimp his awful, shitty book. I thought she knew better than that. But I guess, you know, short straw. It's not her decision. It's not her decision. One day I'd like to see the. We need the decision tree published, but. I want to see. I want to see all the unwritten rules that msnbc oh, and, and there, CNN there use. are there yeah. are definite nbc is a book publisher yeah. they own you know nbc universal whatever conglomerate yeah cbs owns too. A, own yeah they, they own book are... publishing companies and it's their bottom line to cross pollinate mm-hmm. that, those dollars that's free advertising for their product absolutely mm-hmm. I couldn't see her but i could hear her just flailing and gasping and like struggling like well, would you agree that it was it was, you know, it was terrible. And he was but just he's not he is not going to vary from the I'm no. the true conservative. Donald Trump isn't a conservative, isn't a real Republican. Oh, he's, he's not a Republican, he's not a real Republican. Yeah. What don't you think maybe if you would have maybe gone in front of Congress? No, nope. liberal Democrats, liberal, liberal Democrats, those liberal Democrats, they wanted to play politics with impeachment and they blew it. They could have gone the Sam Dash route. They could have gone the Sam Irvin route. They could have worked with Republicans across the aisle, you know, everyone in, in good faith working with each other. Then that would have, then impeachment would have happened. But they decided, no, let's use impeachment to whip up the base. And at that point, there should have been a big fucking hook 
where Sandman yep. Sims with a broom swept his sorry ass, his mustachioed lying hole off the stage, never to be heard from again. Well, was, and and let's face it, Stephen Colbert did a much better job interviewing John Bolton yeah. than Nicole well, Wolfs did. Oh, he he did, and he did, yeah. and but and here's the thing: someone uh, in response to this on the social media said, "Did you see Stephen Colbert shredded?" John Bolton on TV. I said, really? Because he didn't look shredded when he was on MSNBC. Right. See, no, shredded means destroyed. D- it's a professional wrestling to these people. <laughs> it's like, did you see him slam him with a body yeah, blow? Slam, oh, my slam. God. Yes, he right. clotheslined him. And well, uh, next week, he's right back. Oh, I guess he yeah. wasn't destroyed. I guess he. this is all just a fucking show. Um, so, yes, yeah, Stephen Colbert did terrible things to John Bolton, which did, did not affect him in any way at all. Didn't 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 slow him down. Didn't stop him from lying. Didn't prevent him from going out on MSNBC and every place else and pimping his. It book. didn't stop CBS from putting a picture of John Bolton's book no. on the screen either. No. So it made no yeah. difference. Appearing having Stephen Colbert stick it to you made absolutely no difference whatsoever, and that just makes me very sad because it really does mean that we are we are in two completely parallel realities. Yeah, and John yeah. Bolton going on MSNBC and pantsing Nicole Wallace, and just every question was pivoted back to, uh, "It's not my fault. I was the brave one." Democrats, liberal, liberal Democrats, Democrats, liberal, 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 liberal Democrats. radical Democrats, yeah, uh, and yeah. and how liberal Democrats blow everything, and how they're terrible people, and blah blah. And blah, I blah, won't blah. vote for I won't vote for Joe Biden. I'm no, going to write in a Joe principal well, Joe conservative. A, he's going to write in himself, is what he's going to do. Joe Biden's for, a liberal Democrat, and I can't yeah. vote for some liberal Democrat. And it's like, yeah, oh, so this he's always see. Here's the thing: he's always been this way. This he was, has, but, this, but 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 I will yeah. say this: uh-huh. the I think that. One of the reasons that Trump's poll numbers among certain people that you would not expect to stray from the Republican Party, uh-huh. John Bolton gives them a, an out yeah. to not vote for Trump. Well, maybe that's true. And you know, and, one of those people might be yeah. Carly Who? Fiorina. Carly Fiorina, except she said she is going to vote for Biden. Well. Which does not help her in my book. No. She is She is still an awful person. Always has been. And uh, you mentioned and reminded everybody in what I thought, I haven't read your David Brooks post yet, but your Carly Fiorina post this week was, to my mind, the best post of the week. Well, yeah. Um, Thank you. Because you you reminded everyone of her horrendous blood libel lies against Planned Parenthood, in which not only did she lie about it, she used a graphic photo of a fetus that was not accurate in any way and then basically told the media that called her out for it well fuck you right i don't have to have facts all i have to do is have an emotional turbulent active uh hatred for democrats over the abortion issue and i win right and david brooks and uh, chuck, todd. chuck todd and andrea mitchell and- Andrea, Andrea Mitchell, Mitchell said, well, yeah, you know, the 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 electorate really isn't interested in fact right now. It's true. It really it's worked for passion. her. I guess she it's OK. Yeah, she, yeah, so I uh, guess it's OK that she lied. And she went on a whole bunch of shows and said exactly the same thing. And everyone just sort of wilted. It's like, well, she's lying. So we're helpless. What can we do? The public wants passion now. You know, the public wants to see this is where the electorate is right now to a direct quote from David Brooks. Right. Right. And Andrea Mitchell, who was so desperate to not lose her job on television, had to pivot mid sentence to say to, you know, well, both sides. Yeah. She yeah. said, you know, it's the electorate actually in both political parties, mm-hmm. because yep. if she doesn't say that the little bomb they had planted in her head goes off and she collapses and they get a new Andrea Mitchell and bring and drag her body off. Because if you, unless you are going to sit in that fucking chair and blame both sides, you do not get a job on TV. That's the thing I don't think my liberal friends understand. These things don't happen by accident. There are executives who hire these people and put them in these chairs, Chuck Todd specifically, to act exactly this way. So when people on social media get righteously angry, how the fuck does Chuck Todd still have a job? Hey, great question. Why don't you ask the people who run MSNBC, not me? Because he's doing the job they hired him to do. His job is to sit there like a lump of shit and say, you know, it really is both sides. You know, the problem with Hillary Clinton is she's overprepared, you know, and, and that is his job. It's not to do journalism in any way. And, and that corrupt bargain in the media is everywhere. It's half the New York Times op-ed columnists are there because they tell comforting lies to the people who buy the New York Times. 
Yep. And, and there, I'm going to I'm going to switch gears here for just a minute. Yeah. Rachel Bittacoffer show tweeted about a leaked internal poll from uh-huh. the Trump 2020 people. And Oops. I really do think that the name of the polling agency is try that rub shit in its hair polling. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the questions on this quote unquote poll that th- that tr- either Trump 2020 or the Republican Party paid for uh-huh. were questions like, do you want radical Democrats to increase your payroll taxes by 20 percent? Yes or no. Mm-hmm. Wow. Are, <laughs> are you comfortable with John McCain's black baby? <laughs> that was an actual question in yes, South Carolina. That That's that, what puts, that, and do, are you comfortable yeah. knowing that John McCain loses his mind every time a Vietnamese is in his presence and might go crazy <laughs> and kill people? Are you comfortable with that? Answer yes or no. Yes, yes or answer no. yes or no. And yeah. that is yeah. how you, you push poll. That's what's called push polling. You it's called push polling. You give people a horrible question and ask them if it's okay with them and this horrible thing happens. And when they say no, it's like, well. I'm assuming that this poll was uh, signed off on by Brad Parscale to oh, give yeah. Donald Trump numbers that he wanted. He's, he's going to take away that's my what they're, That's what these agencies are supposed to present to the client, you know, poll numbers that they'll want to ask for more poll numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is getting to the point where you you can't trust – Anything. Uh, or, well, but Donald Trump trusts what he sees on Fox and right. OANN, and he's going to trust good news because he's wired that way. No, I mean, I mean, meanwhile, meanwhile, anything, out here in the real world, you can't trust anything they say about anything. Yeah. But but I think that is in part that war on reality is mm-hmm. part of their cache of weapons. And so, always has been. Let's let's not yeah. forget that this yeah. is not the Republican Party did not come into existence in 2016. They right. have been at war with reality for as long as I've been an adult. And for as meanwhile, long as, meanwhile, <laughs> mm-hmm. Chuck Schumer gives up and just mails out Donald Trump's letter to Chuck Schumer. Yes. Unedited right. in a fundraising mailer. Mm-hmm. Here's what Donald Trump wrote. And it's oh. it is a two page letter full of uh, ranting oh. and railing. And you aren't fair to me. And on White House letterhead. This is an official letter. This is not official a letter text. on White House letterhead. From the president, so-called president of the United States, to Chuck Schumer. And mm-hmm. Chuck Schumer copied it and sent it out as a fundraiser for yes, the Senate Democrats. You're a yep. smelly, smelly, dirty man. You're a smelly and man unfair, and dirty. Unfair. Unfair. You're, you're yes. weak and a cuck and you're weak. And I uh, drink your tears. And this is, you know, this dribbling, mindless, racist halfwit is worshipped as a demigod by 60 million Americans. Now, tell me about this uh, memories item you have on our list, the Pew Forum, Religious Republicans Hanging Tough with Bush. I just wanted to remind everyone, in the interest of breaking the most sacred rule of Beltway journalism, which is you never, ever, ever mention shit that happened yesterday. If you look at this Pew poll from 2007, it talks about how the religious right hangs tough with Bush. The religious right completely supports the Iraq war. The religious right thinks he's doing a fucking wonderful job. They loved Bush harder than any other demographic, even normal Republicans. This is from 2007. This is from 13 years ago. These are the people that up until five minutes ago, Rick Wilson was was pandering to. And milking, yeah. And milking and, and cheating out of their money and to get them to the fucking polls to vote against the scary black man, Barack mm-hmm. Obama. Mm-hmm. I, for one, will not pretend that didn't happen. Now, maybe it's not important to some people. I understand that. Well, um, it's important to some people on Twitter last night who I was very grateful to see ah, had yeah. noticed that the people from the Lincoln Project are the very people who are going to be running anti-Kamala Harris ads yeah. in 2024. And, well, and there was a whole lot of agreement behind that and keeping receipts on Nikki Haley and uh, – you know, we got we have to amplify those voices as well as shout our truth um, yeah. for ourselves. All well, right. Uh, we're about halfway through the podcast. It's uh-huh. time for a David Brooks moment. OK, well, David Brooks wrote a column in The New York Times. David Brooks now has two jobs. He works for The Atlantic and he works for The New York Times in a time when thousands of reporters are getting fired. He's getting two jobs, which is weird and sad to me. And David Brooks cited uh, in his column today the five crises that America's face. And they're they're all legitimate and real except for one. <laughs> and one of them is completely made up in his head. And it 
happens to be the most important one based on the fact that he spent his entire column, uh, half of his column, bedwetting about this one problem. Um, it was the problems were the, the collapse of the economy, which is true, COVID-19, which we have all just given up on. No, we haven't given up on shit. Republicans have, but but it would burn your tongue with fire to say that. So David Brooks is never going to say that. And, um, and let's let's point out that uh, Paul Krugman went full drift glass on that one last he week. Did. Yeah, he was like, no, no, it's not. We, we it's Republicans. Yes. Yeah. But the crisis are the, the uh, racism, which is legitimate, and the economic depression that's coming around the corner, which is true. COVID-19, uh, the death spiral of the of Donald Trump's Republican Party, uh, which I said, for the record, um, is also David Brooks's Republican Party. So yes. quit lying about you being a Republican, David Brooks. And secondly, for the record, the rejection of this party of imbeciles and bigots is in no way a crisis. It is something to be <laughs> celebrated. That is not a crisis. That is a good thing. <laughs> um, but to David Brooks, it's like the end of the fucking planet. But really, um, the worst of all, the most terrible, the hide your kids, hide the pets, hide the senior citizens, worst of all, are the social justice monsters. Oh, Lord. The so with their elite universities oh. and, their, and their performative zealotry. He really unlimbered all of his favorite hippie punching vocabulary to just lay into these social justice warriors. And, and um, can, can I, I know you have a very long memory when it comes to david brooks yes i do he does this at times of crisis for the republican party oh he does regularly he does. He, he, this he is does. very predictable yeah it, it's all there's always some uh, upstate elite college in connecticut where things are just as bad as the iraq war you know <laughs> i mean it's just it's like that and like, yeah well but on the other hand liberal democrats took down that statue of that nice mr jefferson davis right and right. that was mean too and and he really – because he's a parasite. And by the way, if you listen carefully to uh, your good friends, the Never Trumpers and people like that, listen for the word performative. Performative. Another word I hate. Everything liberals do now is performative. We don't really believe shit. We virtue signal. We do it for performance reasons. Performative is the new favorite word. It's, the, it's replacing libtard mm -hmm. as the term they use when they talk among themselves about you and me, blue gal. So – there's half a column of all these terrible things that the social justice warriors are doing and how they don't really care about things, how they're a product of elite academics, how they only care about gestures and buildings. They don't care about real fucking reform. And the first thing I thought was, now here's a guy who hasn't been tear gassed nearly enough. And then I calmed myself and I began asking my, my brain archive, where have I heard David Brooks do exactly this shit before? Oh, yeah. It was during the Iraq War, where he spent column after column after column when he was the managing editor of Bill Crystal's Weekly Standard, just shitting all over liberals for our performative behavior and our performative zealotry. And it doesn't matter what you believe in. It matters how you perform your opinions in public and how parochial we are. And how we still live in the 1960s and how we're playing culture war. By the way, I'm pulling exact quotes from here. And, you know, he called us those damn peace nicks because David Brooks was born a 72-year-old man. And how we were drunk on our own decadence and our own moral exhibitionism. And he went on and on and on and on, column after column, about how what shitty, awful people those marching protesters are. And he's never taken a word of it back. By the mm -hmm. way, never, mm -hmm. never, never. This was during a time when he literally invented an imaginary average American called Joey Tabula Rasa. And into Joey's mouth, David Brooks put all that working class, blue collar, aw shucks, pro-war wisdom that David Brooks wanted to tell his cloistered audience existed out there in the heartland. A place where David Brooks has never fucking visited for a day in his life. But he wrote long columns about how Joey... Joey's just a normal guy who loves a six pack of beer and really doesn't understand these marching people and how they, they seem to be so interested in what they did in the sixties and how it all seems very archaic. And, you know, it's, they're Hollywood and academic types, not like Joey, who's a real fucking American. And it really is him just reaching into a, a bag of tricks he was using 17 years ago to bash the shit out of the same sort of people. Because he hates those people. Mm -hmm. Because those people mm -hmm. make him look like the parasite idiot that he is. And and when that falls apart as hard as, as it's fallen apart under Trump, David Brooks does not know what to do except to go back, find some liberal somewhere doing something wrong, and lay into him with a baseball bat. 
Yep. And that's my five minutes at David Brooks. In related news to that, uh-huh. hearing today about the editor of the New York Times say, oh, I have no regrets at all over Hillary email coverage. I wish the paper no. had more been more in touch with the anger vote. You know what? I got your anger vote right here. Why don't you come visit? I'll show it to you. <laughs> well, and and I was grateful to Carolee, my colleague at Crooks and Liars, who said, you know, this is sexist assholery. That's what this is. Mm-hmm. He wishes his paper, you know, the paper of record, was more in touch with the misogynist bullies who love to hate women. That's yes. what this is about. And you have in your note, in our notes here, uh, just mm-hmm. a reminder that in the middle of this resurging pandemic, the Trump administration has doubled its efforts to destroy the Affordable Care Act and deprive tens of millions of Americans from health care. Then the New York Times said, quote, Republicans have long said their goal is to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, but have yet to agree on an alternative. The New York Times is dead inside. I agree with you on that. Yeah, utterly dead inside. Take that in, listeners. Yeah. In the middle of a resurging pandemic. The most important Trump administration priority is taking health care away from tens of millions of people. And the best the New York Times can offer is, well, you know, they promised to deliver stuff and they haven't really decided on what they're going to do yet. And all I can think of is, oh, nobody at the New York Times is going to lose their health care coverage. Right. This isn't going to come into their homes. This isn't going to take theirs away. Nope. No, so, take ours okay. away. Not, not our problem. Yeah. Yeah. And And Joe Biden was very wise to point out that all of a sudden anyone who has COVID-19 has a pre-existing condition. Yep. Which is protected under the Affordable Care Act. Your coverage is protected from that, but not well, without it. This week, Donald Trump has sworn that he's, he's he'll protect pre-existing condition. He loves pre-existing condition. Democrats don't. They'll take it away from you. And that and if we just repeal this, I'll have a more beautiful and wonderful alternative than you'll ever imagine. And again, I... These are the ravings of a of a brain dead, mush skull racist uh, psychopath who is worshipped as a demigod by sixty million of your friends and neighbors. Yeah, so, and and then the Bible verse of the day at Bible Gateway was, "Don't seek revenge or carry a grudge against any of your people." <laughs> From Leviticus, I don't, car- <laughs> I don't carry a grudge. I have a special satchel for that with wheels on it. <laughs> wheels, yes. <laughs> I was weepy on Wednesday afternoon, and I finally realized why. I attended at noon that day Mm -hmm. a uh, United Methodist service of lament about race. And I forgot to talk to you about that. I realized this morning when I was writing down this note that, oh, that's why I was crying so much Wednesday afternoon. This church service of lament that was online, you could watch it on YouTube. I watched it uh, Wednesday at noon. And two things about it struck me. One was the constant refrain that God is calling us to do this. God is calling us to pursue racial justice. Mm -hmm. This isn't coming from liberals. It's not coming from one wing of the church. It's coming. And and it's it's easy for anyone in the church to say, you know, this we're doing this because God wants us to, because let's face it, putting Black people into slavery, the argument was God and scripture endorses our lifestyle of doing this, right? Yes, and, and still is in some churches right, to pretty right. much with a so little veil over I it. I get yeah. that. Yeah. But the tone of this was much more, let's listen to the higher power and do what's right and, and do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And then the other thing was the the white bishops and so forth who were, and pastors who were speaking at this really took on the crimes that the church has committed in the name of whiteness. And particularly one of them just brought me to tears because he said, look, we all moved out to the suburbs in the 60s, 50s and 60s. We all moved out to the suburbs and left the inner city churches to pay their dues to the overall church on their own, mm-hmm. uh, deal with crumbling infrastructure and buildings on their own, uh, pretended that it wasn't our, that wasn't our church building, uh, and, and did nothing about wages in the cities, did nothing about justice in the cities, did, just moved out and pretended it wasn't our problem. And that's our church. And it was, it was so stunning to see... Uh, this 
guy who had clearly lived through those years, mm -hmm. uh, confess his sin. Uh, and, and so all of that led to me <laughs> crying all afternoon. But I wanted to share, and I, there was a tweet this after this morning, um, and I don't think this is a United Methodist, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Micah Edmondson tweeted, if Christians would simply listen to the cries of their own brothers and sisters in Christ, the church would be ahead of the national conversation about racial justice instead of behind it. I see that. I think we have to start talking about who is my brother, who is my sister in Christ. I will say that I do see the atheist's side of this. Oh, well, I included because, that in my retweet as well. <laughs> yes. Well, and because it's, it is for an institution that claims to be in touch with almighty God. Right. You seem almighty slow um, catching up <laughs> with the shit that everyone else got 30, right. 40, 50, 70, right. 100, 200 years well, ago. Well, a lot of, let's be fair, a lot of Christians got there too at that time, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. And, and there was a time. Lord, there was a time, you know, when it, the the solution to all problems was westward expansion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you didn't like, you know, if, if if the church you didn't you were at you didn't like you you move west, you steal some land from some people, um, you know, you you kill a bunch of buffalo, you stake your claim, and you declare yourself the new Jerusalem, and then you'd have a schism, and then or a schism, and the next group would would move further and move further. There is no place left to run. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and there's no place left to to hide. Um, we're stuck with each other. And the people who want to live in the past, whether it's political or whether whether it's by their interpretation of the Bible, um, I do get the incredible impatience of um, people who are f relatively far to my left. And I do get the impatience of atheists going, what the fuck is your problem? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the, the answer, mm -hmm. the answer to this is very clear. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you embracing what is clearly the obvious solution to this problem? Why are you hanging on to this archaic, you know, institutional bullshit that you would know that, you know, is corrupt and bad and wrong. And I, I think there's a lot of merit to that. And that's well, they don't why. know that it's bad and wrong because they're willing to put blinders on so that they don't see it. Well, what I'm saying is, why are you people in the institution who can see what's wrong? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why aren't you leaving? Yeah, <laughs> why don't you just yeah. go? I mean, these people are never going to change. They're never going to see see the light. They're never going to see that that a, a gay pastor is every bit a child of God and every bit is worthy of, of ordination as a straight pastor. They're never going to see that. Never. Until the day they die. They're not going to let a gay person bury them or marry their children. So why not just leave them to their ignorance because they're old and they'll die soon and go off? Why are you trying to reform this essentially corrupt institution? I'm not saying that that is a persuasive argument. It won't, it won't get me loose of the church, but I can see the point of it. Yeah. I can see people going, you're hanging on to an institution that hates you, that hates what you stand for and is never going to change. And if you want to hang around for a century or two, yeah grindingly slow they will gradually make their way by death and uh demographics to where you already are well um, but but you too you have also told me of attending a black church well, which yes. was right on every social justice issue except uh -huh. for this absolutely. is a manly hug this That's is not a right. gay hug up here in absolutely front of the right. church no no, I'm, I'm not saying it's this church specifically. I'm saying I do understand the argument of those outside of the institution going, Jesus, you're fight, you're still fighting over this shit? Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Right. Maybe, you know, maybe your invisible sky god, maybe believing the invisible sky god is the problem. I don't have to agree with that. But I can understand oh, yeah. their impatience. No, I, I totally can understand. understand where they're coming from. Yeah. And the fact that it took till the year of our Lord 2019 for this to become a vote in the conference of the United right. Methodist Church is absurd. And the people that are walking out, which is just one person, one couple, mm -hmm. walking out of our particular church building, walked out because the pastor, the straight pastor who is married and has two children and is, you know, faithful to his wife and in a nuclear family where he is the father and his wife is a, is a biological woman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. said, LGBTQ plus in the pulpit. Can't have that. And they walked out. Yeah. And I would rather be in the church where 
those people walk out. <laughs> I, I I completely agree. There's also a kind of I can get this sort of amusing sense of this institution that Blaze claimed to interpreting scripture correctly and being in touch with the word of God that is being run like the Department of Motor Vehicles. Yeah, well, where it's, there's it's that. this enormous bureaucracy yes. and everything's yep. a fucking vote and there's all yep. these blocks of people and there's a conference and there's another conference and yep. there's another conference. Like, yep. really? Why, why don't you just ask God? <laughs> Isn't that how you do things? I mean, why are you? Well, because there's property involved and there's salaries well, involved. Well, and, and pensions. Involved. Oh, my God, there's pensions. pensions yes, right. All these worldly items they that are real They made sure that the pensions of the churches leaving were protected before they made any decisions. Yes. Anyway. Oh, all right. I'm going to end. I'm going to do a Bible bitch. Bible bitch. That's not scriptural. Bible bitch. Micah 6, 8. The King James Version is... He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And the message says, which is a more modern translation, but he's already made it plain how to live, what to do. What God is looking for in men and women, it's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love, and don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah. Take God seriously. All right. We're... That seems pretty reasonable, you ask me. <laughs> that seems like a very reasonable request. <laughs> Shall we Let's do a very do quick a news roundup? news roundup. Yep. Sure. Uh, dozens of Secret Service officers and agents have been told to self-quarantine after Donald Trump's Tulsa hate rally that blew up in his face and only had five people show and up. And the jury is still out on Arizona. The U.S. has seen a record number of new coronavirus cases for the second straight day. Over 20 states are experiencing increases in positive cases. Texas government has slowed its reopening plans. Younger people from 20 to 44 are making up an alarming number of positive cases. Florida's median age of positive cases has dropped to 35 from 65 in March. As of yesterday, our county, Sangamon County in Illinois, the Department of Public Health has reported two new positive cases, a total of 402, with 8,068 people tested, and I'm going to say this, only 33 deaths in Sangamon County. Well, and the, the stats that I'm hearing, and I'm sure everyone out there is hearing, this is on Friday, the, the 26th, is that for every uh, one tested reported case there is 10 out there that are unknown and unreported so and may have no number, symptoms at this point right yeah so the actual number of coronavirus cases is is 10 times larger than it appears on any of the charts you see and that's not um, counting when the state of florida lies about it right yeah or anyone else that lies about it under the pressure of you're going to give me good numbers or i'll be cutting off your your federal funding right the New York Times wrote today that the V-shaped recovery has died of coronavirus. Uh, a swift rebound from the pandemic was always unlikely, but COVID-19's resurgence has now rendered one impossible. That means we are looking down the barrel of a depression, which you and I have never lived through. And uh, that is that is unless the Congress decides to pump a lot of printed money into the economy to keep yeah. it afloat. Yeah. Which they can do, which yep. they can and should do. I mean, yep. this really Absolutely. is this is an emergency, and an emergency requires emergency measures. According to Dr. Fauci, the White House ordered the National Institute of Health to cancel coronavirus research funding. Research was a target of a conspiracy theory about the origin of the new coronavirus. The National Institutes of Health abruptly cut off funding to a longstanding, well-regarded research project on bat coronaviruses only after the White House specifically told it to do so, according to Dr. Anthony Fauci. And uh, we know from crazy Florida lady that everything from Bill Gates to G5 to, you know, they, there are just a group of people out there that believe this shit. Yes, they're called Republicans. <laughs> and they have a lot of influence with the crazy, you know, mush-brained asshole in the White House who can then turn around and order shit like this to stop or start, depending right. on what QAnon told him today. Yeah. And all of them have to go. All of them have to go. This is this is why I will repeat for the umpteenth time, it is so important to remember that Donald Trump is not the problem. 
Donald Trump is the fruit of a poisonous Republican tree that has roots that go back 50 years. And anyone who tells you that the problem started in 2016 and we're not going to talk about anything before that is trying to get you to cut your own throat, is trying to convince you to do something that will you will regret, I swear to God, regret brutally two or three years from now. As anyway, I put on Facebook today, Fox News, watching Fox News will kill you. From the Department of Too Little Too Late, uh, Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott, remember him? has ordered all bars to shut down as of today and restaurants must reduce capacity to 50% starting Monday as the state has seen a spike in COVID-19 hoax cases uh, since June 1st. Cases in Texas have doubled and hospitalizations have nearly tripled. Meanwhile, in Illinois, phase four of the reopening started today and our governor deserves a lot of credit for the success of the plan, as do the citizens of the state of Illinois for wearing masks. There really has been... Uh, I think, a large amount of compliance and cooperation. There has. It's still... Uh, and financial it, sacrifice. Yeah. The, the people who, who get st the stink eye in public are not the people wearing masks, the people who don't. So yep. it is a... It is, it's peer pressure. It's yeah. the number one thing. The way things change in the world is peer pressure. And peer pressure in our area, in our community, is on... Come on, people. Come on. We're it's actually doing better. It's a virus. We're, yes. We're doing better than Texas. We're doing better than Florida. Let's not fuck this up. Okay. Right. And I cannot imagine what it would have been like in Illinois under Governor Hedge Fund. Oh it would God. have been a disaster. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's internet kitty is Chicka, not Dixie Chicka. You know, there's no more yeah. Dixie Chicks. It's just the Chicks. But just the um, this is Chicka. Chicka is short for Chickawawa. Uh, our listener who sent in Chicka said, we did not name her. This was her given name from the shelter. Chicka is a one-year-old tortie with attitude. She was sitting on the couch on Monday watching NB MSNBC when we took this picture. After the president, so-called, announced that he had been taking hydrochloxychloroquine for a week, she had finally happened enough and just stretched out on her back and played dead. Yeah, I would do that, too. She got better the next day. Yes. Here are some fun facts about Chica. She does not know that she is a cat, and she will eat anything. Seriously. We have to really, really watch her. She has hauled an entire loaf of bread off the top of the refrigerator in the middle of the night and hid it behind the couch to snack on it for a week and get the carbo load she needs to keep up her energy. She, You also have to stand close by the toaster so that she does not steal your bagel, English muffin toast, or any other high-carb product. She also likes cheese, yogurt, Doritos, potato chips, pasta, rice, bacon, steak, <laughs> and the standard cat favorite human foods of chicken, tuna, salmon, etc. She only takes an exception to fruits and vegetables, and she particularly hates gluten-free items. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? So say we all. <laughs> With that said, I am absolutely sure she would eat freshly poured cat food. And Dollar Store Direct would be fine, too. Freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve Pet Store Perfection or Dollar Store Direct, we assure you it is not gluten-free. Your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. You can visit Chica and her amazing appetite at our Facebook page <laughs> or website. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We do love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. And I can attest to the fact that if you're having some COVID blues, writing a note to someone that cares about you or that you care about really makes you feel better. And we care about you and would love to hear from you. So oh, if can you I, feel, yeah. Can I share a brief story? Very, very brief. I went to the P.O. box yesterday. Yeah. And, and my guy was there. 
So oh, there's yeah. a young there's a young man there. I haven't seen him in months. I thought he'd been fired or transferred. I guess they rotated him out and rotated him back in. But I, w- I was so happy to see him. He was so happy to see me. He was like, hey, how's it going, man? How are you doing? How are you going? And first thing he asked me was, how's that podcast going? Ah. <laughs> I'm like, you mean the podcast that the motto is Go Postal Unions? And all the postal employees went, yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's all I'm saying is, Word is getting out. So word is getting word out. Is getting Go out. postal unions and what you picked up at the PO box yesterday. Oh, oh my god, oh. yarn, yarn, <laughs> yarn. The good shit too. Not that. The not that direct alpaca and um, I. I am so. It was alpaca from Tennessee. It is fabulous. Uh, I'll put something up at my Twitter stream when I start working with it because it's so soft. I did and, not know there were purple alpaca, but now I do <laughs> know that. You so. never saw a purple alpaca. You never hope no. to see one. Never but hope boy, to see when one. your wife gets purple alpaca <laughs> yarn, it's a happy day. And it came mm-hmm. at just the right time to. Yes, I mean, it did. It, I needed that boost. So thank you. The, and my yarn stash had no problem absorbing it into. Mm-hmm. Although I had yes. to put it in a, a plastic bag because the cats, it it is uh, alpaca from a farm. Mm-hmm. And it is clear that the cats in this house were aware of the farm oh. scent. <laughs> oh, it's all good. They, I, it was going to wind up all over the house if I didn't seal it up. This, but This yarn wants to play. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely smelled like, you know the wild so but i love it and i'm so excited to work with it it's beautiful and soft and and what a treat hashtag save the post office don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline if you can afford to buy an espresso based beverage for yourself buy one for us this is not charity this is our job approximately one percent of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution you can too see our website proleftpod.com for details both our paypal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Happy birthday, middle child. She's going to be 18 next week. Happy birthday. I'm sad. (laughs) Happy for her. Sad for me. Uh, But um, she's a lovely person. And I, she is I'm, a lovely person, and we eat, I, we eat very well now. We're eating much more vegan than we did oh, before. Oh yeah, she's a great cook. She really she is. is. So, so you know, just just adore that girl. All right, but just you got to put up with a lot of shit about the the patriarchy, but you know, <laughs> uh, the the tofu is worth it. It's well yeah, made. It's so. worth it's <laughs> worth the tofu, and yeah, she she still has the um, ugh attitude towards many of the things in the universe Ugh. Yes. although she loves her jeans doesn't she <laughs> she does I, she asked me to embroider on the pocket of one of her jeans i did tweet a picture of that mm-hmm. eat the rich <laughs> mm-hmm. so we raised her right folks <laughs> that was that's one of my birthday presents to her as i embroidered the pocket of her jeans eat the rich so Good for You're us. You're a good mom, Blue Gal. I'm a You're good a good mom. mom. Yeah, mm-hmm. I try. Mm-hmm. Please share our show on social media, and thank you for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties are so sad that Devin Nunez can no longer sue imaginary animals. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying and the shooting and the dying and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020. DGBG Productions.